Uh, my name is John Eastman. I'm the dean at the Chapman University School of Law. Uh, I'm also a constitutional law professor and scholar. And of course, uh, my comments today are in my capacity as a constitutional scholar, not speaking on behalf of Chapman University. It's not a denial of anybody else's right to travel, not to say I have to put them up in my bedroom. I mean, this, this is, uh, uh, and, and it's that confusion that, that lies at the heart of the, the misconceptions about the debate. And there are really two issues. There's a legal issue. Does the Constitution already mandate birthright citizenship? And then there's the policy issue. Um, if it does, should we amend it to uh, get rid of it? Or if it doesn't already mandate it, should we adopt it by statute because it makes good sense? Right. Uh, and you've actually been called upon by Congress to address a variety of issues in, in terms of uh, illegal immigration. And in, in, indeed. In fact, this goes back to a brief I filed in the U.S. Supreme Court in the Yasser Hamdi case. Hamdi was one of the individuals that was detained in Afghanistan, taking up arms against the United States in our, in our war there against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. He was transferred to Guantanamo Bay, um, but when U.S. officials learned that he'd been born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, while his parents were here on a short work visa, uh, they began treating him as a citizen rather than an, an enemy combatant uh, in Guantanamo. They transferred him to Norfolk, and his case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And we argued that that understanding of citizenship, that just because he was born here made him a citizen, is wrong. And we uh, started trying to lay the groundwork for revisiting um, well, what's been about a 50-year popular conception of what the citizenship clause requires. But as a result of that, Hamdi ended up uh, being sent back to Saudi Arabia and he renounced his citizenship. So, so the question of whether he was a citizen in the first place was never presented. Okay. Uh, but, but, but we had laid the argument out there and now members of Congress who are trying to grapple with uh, comprehensive immigration reform sure. and looking at something like temporary guest worker programs and they asked the obvious question, if you have guest worker programs and they're coming here with their families, what do you do with the kids born here if they're citizens? So all of a sudden, the birthright citizenship question is front and center on the logistics of comprehensive immigration reform. I think if I were to ask your audience to raise their hands, how many people think if you're born on U.S. soil, you're a citizen, every hand in the room would go up. Now, the text of the 14th Amendment is actually not quite what we think it is. It says all persons born or naturalized um, in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens. Now it's that last phrase, subject to the jurisdiction, where the fight is. Now we also have this common understanding that when you come here to visit, you're subject to our jurisdiction. You have to obey our traffic laws. If you come from England, you ride on the right side of the road when you're here, not on the left side of the road. Um, but the founders or the framers of the 14th Amendment had in mind two different notions of subject to the jurisdiction. There was what they called temporary or partial or territorial jurisdiction. You have to follow the laws in the place where, you're, where you are. Right. But there was also this more complete or allegiance-owing jurisdiction that you not only have to follow the laws, but that you owe allegiance to the sovereign. Um, and that doesn't come by just visiting here. That comes by taking an oath of support, becoming part of the body politic. And it's that jurisdiction that they're talking about in the 14th Amendment. So that means that somebody's here temporarily, like Hamdi's parents, right. um, working for a two-year on a two-year work permit, never owed allegiance to the United States. Mr. Hamdi couldn't be drafted into the United States Army, and if he took up arms against us, he couldn't be prosecuted for treason. He could be detained as an enemy combatant, um, uh, and so he never was a citizen. And and you know, people here on tourist visas, or even more so, people here uh, illegally who, who never had authority to be here in the first place. But giving birth on U.S. soil doesn't make of their children citizens. How we arrived at this common notion is, is, is really a rather bizarre story. The framers of the 14th Amendment all say it applied to this broader owing allegiance jurisdiction. The first Supreme Court cases to take it up said, yeah, that's right. The first legal treatises to, to be written in, this, in the 1880s said that means it's complete jurisdiction. There's a case in 1898 by the Supreme Court called Wong Kim Ark. Uh, and this involved the child of a permanent lawful Chinese residence. And the Supreme Court's decision, and you can sympathize with why they issued this decision, we had, we had uh, entered into a fairly despicable treaty with the Chinese emperor that deprived Chinese immigrants of their human rights to emigrate. Uh, we refused to recognize that they could ever renounce their 
allegiance to the Chinese emperor. And so these folks had come here, they had established permanent residence, they were here lawfully, they had done everything we permitted them to do, consistent with the treaty, to demonstrate their allegiance to their new sovereign, their new country. Um, and so the Supreme Court said in those contexts, their children will be citizens by virtue of the 14th Amendment. Now it did it with language much broader than that, that said they were born here, therefore they're citizens. Um, for the next 50 years, Nobody took the broader language as, as dispositive. It was, you know, that case was limited to its narrow facts. So in the 1920s, for example, Congress is, extends citizenship to all Native Americans born on U.S. soil. Well, if the 14th Amendment had already mandated it, that act of Congress is unnecessary. Sure. In the 1950s, we have a program with Mexico, the Braceros, uh, the first guest worker program. Right. Their children were not deemed citizens here. Uh, and when the Braceros moved back to Mexico, they took their kids with them because nobody understood that they were citizens yet. Sometime since the 1960s, though, this notion that just mere birth is all you needed started to take root. And I've been debating this issue now for several years, and I have challenged every person who's taken the opposite side of me, tell me what it was that led to this new notion. Um, and nobody, there's not an executive order, there's not a court decision, we just gradually started assuming that birth was enough. Yeah. Um, and I think part of it is um, the loss of our understanding of the language that the framers of the 14th Amendment used. Um, by the 1950s, 1960s, subject to the jurisdiction has come to mean you got to obey our traffic laws when you're here. <laughs> and and right. the, the older notion, this, this bifurcated notion, uh, was lost on us. And so when, then with this new assumption, People would look at the text of the 14th Amendment, they wouldn't question it critically, they just would take what they thought the language meant. The, Article I of the Constitution gives to Congress what's called plenary power to determine policy judgments about naturalization and the levels of immigration. And the reason um, the founders did that was they understood that immigration policy is at, at root a fundamental policy discussion. How many people can we absorb from different parts of the world? Um, and, and, and bring them into the American understanding of the role of self-government. And, you know, people have tried to tag that with, well, they want white Europeans rather than Asians or, or Latinos. That wasn't it at all. They wanted people coming from countries where they had grown accustomed to governing themselves because it's much easier to assimilate. If you have wholesale migration from a, a despotic form of government, you have people that have habits that rose up in despotic regimes, it's much tougher to assimilate them to self-government and, and participatory, participatory democracy. The same thing with illegal immigrants today. Many come from South and Central America. The first thing that they do to come to the United States is break the law. Um, and then they continue to live in the shadows, law-breaking um, uh, by definition. Um, and, and the notion that the, the primacy of the rule of law to our system of government kind of goes out the window. And it's a very dangerous thing. And then there's a different dangerous aspect of it as well. They become preyed upon uh, by coyotes at the border or, or just thugs who know that they won't report the crime for fear of deportation. And that, that undermines their um, commitment to, to the law as well uh, in, a, in, a, in a devastating way to them uh, as well as to us. And then, and then you get businesses that foster and play off of this because they are able to get cheap labor. And it's not because they're paying them less than the minimum wage because they've got all sorts of tax returns and you know, that will come out. The, where their benefit comes is they now have a, a workforce that won't sue them when they're fired. Oh, um, any number of benefits. That's them. right. Sure. And, and, and yeah, you step back and ask yourself, with all of the pro-expansion of immigration forces, the civil rights communities and what have you, and big business that claims they need more labor. Right. That's a combination that could get any bill through Congress in five minutes if they wanted to increase the level of legal immigration. And you have to ask yourself, why hasn't that happened? Because, because people have a vested interest in having an illegal immigrant population and a subclass that generates it. You know, uh, Thomas Jefferson talks about immigration in very favorable terms. What they were trying to do then is populate a continent um, uh, so that it will stand European pressures to take us back over again and what have you. The, the dynamic has changed now. Um, and uh, what we've done by, by having very low quotas on legal immigration um, and then uh, turning a blind eye to a massive illegal immigration, you, you create um, this subclass, um, you create this extraordinary drain on our social services that is bankrupting most of the state and local governments 
that are in the path of this migration wave. Um, you, you foster both an entitlement mentality, but also a, 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 a ignoring of the rule of law. And, and the legal immigration patterns of the last century were tough enough to assimilate uh, without losing the rule of law as well. And we are doing that. And we, we are embarked upon a very dangerous experiment at the moment.